Welcome everybody to Africa Talks to edition number 20. We have, as you all know, further developed the concept of the web talk. And I am more than honored uh, to introduce again my co-host from Namibia, Sipiwe Lutibetsi. Good to have you on the show, Sipiwe. Thank you very much, Marco, for the introduction. I am Sipiwe Lutibetsi, and I'm looking forward to co-hosting Africa Talks and to discuss African and European topics with the alumni of International Journalist Network, IJP, and our distinguished guests. Perfect. Um, Africa Talks is designed as a digital platform for exchange of knowledge and ideas between journalists and experts from civil society from both continents. Uh, I'm Marco Folmer. I'm a member of the board of the International Journalist Programs, IJP. And our topic for today, the war in Ukraine. How can Africa and Europe cope with the dramatic consequences? According to the UN Global Crisis Response Group, the war in Ukraine is setting in motion a three-dimensional crisis in food, energy, and finance, which are having alarming cascading effects on the global economy already battered by COVID-19 and climate change. It threatens to derail development progress in African countries and push the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals and Aspirations of the African Union's Agenda 2063 into a distant future. Although prices for some commodities have fallen, have fallen due to high inflation, the situation remains tight for billions of people whose socioeconomic prospects are worsening as a result. What are some of the implications for Africa and Europe? What could be common approaches or concepts to address these challenges? These and other questions we would like to discuss with our distinguished guests. Timothy Nyagi is a seasoned development economist with a wealth of 18 years of experience in the fields of development planning, policy implementation and research. He holds a PhD in development economics. He has experience in the public sector, having worked with the National Treasury and Planning in Kenya. And he is currently a research fellow with Tigimio Institute of Agricultural Policy and Development of Egerton University in Nairobi. Um, his current research focus is on agricultural productivity, technology adoption, governance, and efficiency of agricultural system, systems, climate resilience, and evaluation. He aspires to make a significant contribution towards addressing food insecurity and poverty in developing countries. Welcome, and great to have you here on Africa Talks. Thank you, and uh, thank you for having me on the show. And our second panelist is Melanie Müller from Germany. Dr. Melanie Müller is a senior associate with a focus on Southern Africa at the German Institute for International and Security Affairs, SWP, in Berlin, and head of two research projects with a focus on mineral supply chain. Melanie has been working on political and social development in South Africa since 2011. She has also conducted research in other countries of the SADC region. Melanie has published extensively on the political and socioeconomic development in Southern Africa, on resource governance and migration, as well as on European-African relations. Before joining SWP in 2017, she worked as a research associate at the lecture and lecturer at the Free University of uh, Berlin, and as a consultant for public and private actors with a focus on resource governance. Melanie, welcome and good to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to our discussion. Last but not least, I may introduce Christian Foren. He's a journalist from the opinion-leading media site online. He is an editor in the Politics, Business and Society Department. And since the beginning of the Russian War of Aggression, he has been reporting regularly from Ukraine. Christian, very pleased to have you on Africa Talks. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. We would also like to let you, our uh, viewers, know that our colleague Verushka Bon is our graphic reporter and she will be taking graphic notes of this talk. Now, let's jump into Africa talks. Christian, we'll start with you. You have visited Ukraine three times this year. 
How would you describe the current situation? The current situation is about to change in Ukraine right now as uh, winter is coming. For now, it is comparably warm, but still slightly below zero degrees, um, which makes it more and more difficult for the people living in the country um, because they are uh, suffering from blackouts, they are suffering from the cold, and also as the soil gets frozen slowly, experts expect a new offensive coming up soon by Russia because they can move then and on the eastern front lines you can see they bring heavy artillery and the fightings might be more intense in the next few weeks. Thank you, um, Christian. Um, Timothy, um, I would like to ask you, he's gone now, right? Um, I missed uh, ah, here, here, there he is again. Um, maybe yeah, there he is, Timothy. Um, just a, a question from your point of view as an agricultural expert. Um, what are, from your perspective, um, the dramatic consequences of the war in the Ukraine? You must go for the question. Um, from the war in Ukraine, we have both direct and indirect effects. Direct effects comes from the things that you know countries in sub-Saharan Africa relied uh, mainly from uh, you know, Russia and Ukraine. For example, uh, Russia, Ukraine, both Ukraine and Russia are key sources of of grain, especially wheat and corn. And um, at the advent of the war, um, you realize that, that those those were immediately cut off, uh, mainly because, especially for countries like Kenya. Ukraine is, a, is an important source because of previously we had a ban on GM and uh, you know the markets that were providing non-GM products were very, very important for countries like Kenya. Um, <clears throat> beyond that, you realize also that uh, countries like Russia are important for input use, especially fertilizers. And um, what what we also saw was that you know immediately the war started it means that you could you couldn't access these markets the indirect effects especially came through like energy um because of the global shock because of uh you know energy prices started going up uh logistics were taking more time and and also going up and and then that had of course uh, another effect in terms of adding prices uh to the local of prices which are already rising because of the the shortages because you don't have enough grain so the biggest impact we've seen especially in africa is on food prices um that has been the the most significant effect where you see that uh prices for key commodities especially wheat and corn uh started rising of course right now we are at a point where it has kind of stabilized but it has stabilized after having risen and this of course affects a lot of uh, households uh, and especially poor households who now have to spend more to get food thank you for that um melanie i'd like to ask um this war what what impact does it have on other commodities and supply chains um I would add to what what Tim has said that um, I think there is a much another indirect effect, and it is in a way how especially European states and probably also the U.S. Uh, look at the world, and we see a rise of a new geopolitics, uh, mm -hmm. you could call it, so that um, states take much more into account with whom to work, and especially with regard to Europe, the dependencies on Russia. Uh, has created some sort of attention on other dependencies in other supply chains. Because I think the narrative is now that um, while globalization might be good and like, um, you know, European states and also Germany actively supported it at the same time, they also should investigate uh, like very strong dependencies in certain supply chains because as we can see, I mean, Germany especially is highly affected um, by um, the um, you know, the, the um, so to say, relationship or non-relationship with, with Russia now uh, with regard to gas. So um, this <clears throat> means uh, that other dependencies um, are more in the focus and um, China is at the center of it. Um, because when we take minerals, for example, which is a field um, I'm looking at, 
uh, European states import um, certain minerals and metals or, or are completely dependent on China, not necessarily because extraction is happening there, but because smelting and refining is located in China. That means all of it goes via China. We have um, dependencies between 75 and sometimes 100%. Um, and I think um, this creates a new narrative in a way, which you might have heard about friend shoring, where the question is, um, with whom to trade, with whom to work. So is it wise to rely so much on one country uh, when, you know, there might be a foreign policy or even domestic issues that could affect trade? And I think it's some kind of continuity because discussions on this have started during the pandemic already. Um, because, of course, we were all aware how dependent we are on each other. And so there was a question about mm -hmm. strategic relocation of supply chains. But now the reshoring and nearshoring discussion is, um, you know, is um, probably dominated by the question of friend shoring and also how to find new partnerships. And I think this is where we saw already that certain African countries um, also uh, are in the focus now. And there, I think there is a room to negotiate new partnerships. But that, of course, needs to take um, also the African interests into account. Mm -hmm. Could you, could you let us know, Melanie, an additional question to that um, point. Could you let us know, um, isn't, that, isn't that a chance for a, I would say, maybe not a revival is not the right word, for a better, for a better start, for better, um, um, a better relationship between Europe and, uh, uh, and, and Africa, uh, between both continents? Because as you say, here, we, we the, the, the change of interest mm. at the moment is, is obvious and, uh, uh, could it be um could it be um an opportunity i mean of course it could be but i think also like my observation is that many african states but also like uh, citizens are a bit disappointed with the european union especially when we look back um at the pandemic when the european union was very much concerned with itself uh, when we think about, you know, the unequal distribution of vaccines and also uh, medical equipment and other supplies. Um, so I think this has created um, a lot of disappointment. Also, um, the hesitance at the beginning um, to support a waiver for vaccines. I think these are aspects that need to be taken into account, as well as the migration regime uh, that the EU uh, had implemented. So I think you know, it looks a bit, which I can understand, that now uh, that Europe lost its other friends, uh, they might turn towards Africa um, um, with a like instrumental interest, if I if I if I may use that word. But at the same time, I think it also offers um, a window of opportunity to really negotiate or renegotiate that relationship. And I, what I see is that African states have much more power now because also European actors are aware that African countries can also choose their partners. So I think the question is now, what are the demands of African states? Um, what are the necessities and how to maybe also integrate it into regional development agendas, into African foreign policy agendas? And I think they can now do that. I also, like from my observation in Europe, in Germany, I see much more openness and also a willingness to learn um, so I think, of course, it creates an opportunity and uh, we should use it. Uh. Okay, we come later maybe to the question and hopefully to an answer how to use it, because this is always crucial, uh, uh, the way how it works. I think uh, we all know a lot about all these things, but the, the question is uh, how to implement or how to, um, yeah, how, to, how to make it happen. Um, I would like to structure our conversation right now into three parts, if you don't mind, um, uh, namely um, into uh, the food crisis, into the energy and uh, uh, commodity uh, uh, questions, and into strategic uh, uh, into the strategic field. And I would start uh, um, uh, with the food crisis, Timothy. Um, um, you just said prices are, ri are rising, um, uh, uh, like it hits as always the poorest uh, and uh, uh, um, at least like um, the consequences of the war, of the war far away in Europe, in the Ukraine and in Russia, uh, like in the Ukraine, in Eastern Europe, um, is um, tackling African countries and African people. What would you say, uh, what needs to be done from your point of view? 
Well, Marco, one of the things that needs to be done is that um, uh, we need to explore a number of strategies. The first one, of course, is that we need to see how we can help uh, African countries produce more. This year, of course, has been a, a strange one because as all this was happening, it was a culmination of shocks. Um, uh, we had a, a, a drought that was happening in the north of Africa even before we recovered from the effects of the pandemic. So it, it made a bad situation become worse. So how do one of the conversations we must engage with is how do we uh, help you know, African countries produce more, especially in the context of changing climate? The other one is very close to what uh, Melanie had already started talking about. So who are your sources of, 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 of food if you cannot produce more? So the danger has always been that if you look at most of the food trade with African countries, uh, there is always reliance to, to over rely or to rely to a large extent on one or two source countries. Uh, this is not necessarily by design. Sometimes it's because of the, the bilateral nature of trade. Uh, and if you have a country that, for example, tends to buy more from you and needs uh, what you're producing, then you see, you'll find that... Um, you tend to concentrate and you can look at not just whatever was happening with Ukraine, but you can look at what happens, for example, with commodities like rice with Asian countries and you realize that many African countries, for example, would be getting rice from one country uh, to up to 60 or 70 percent. And in the case of Kenya, I think we get say 80 percent of our rice from Pakistan. So if something happens to Pakistan today, we're in jeopardy. So like when we see flooding in Pakistan, we're already worried because that has a direct effect on our food system. So how do we diversify this um, beyond what beyond what you're producing? And how do we also uh, encourage uh, you know, less reliance um, on, uh, on, on one country so that it kind of reduces your, your vulnerability? So we have... Um, a number of opportunities, I think, locally that we, we've been trying to, to work with uh, government to see that these are promoted, one, it, especially on building resilience, uh, uh, moving away from the traditional uh, crops to more, or, I mean, moving away from the, the, what we call the commercialized crops to more of what we consider to be traditional crops, uh, crops like cassavas, millets, you know, sorghums that you know used to do very well but probably because they were not commercialized uh maize wheat rice became you know the kind of go-to product and people kind of move to those products so how do we re restore because right now we know that if most of our farmers are producing millets uh, sorghums cassavas then that kind of helps us especially if you think about availability of food and also most of these foods are very nutritious compared to you know what what people are consuming now so it kind of helps us balance out both availability and the nutrition quality of food but then these are not immediate immediate solutions so these are like medium to long term solutions in the immediate term of course we have to think of where do we get um, food to import from um, and 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 you know which which countries would this be? One of the other key, of course, the important thing is to look at the geo, the 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 the, the global uh, food 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 markets, and um, we are also happy that you know the Kenya, the currently the Kenyan government um, is um, has lifted the ban on uh, on GMO because that provides an extra solution, especially if you think of. Um, uh, food as not just food for human consumption, but as well as livestock as well. So we know that uh, globally, uh, there's a lot of uh, cheaper feeds, animal feeds that are available in the global market. But because of those kind of policies that Kenya had pursued in the past, they were unable to take advantage of that. So that that also kind of uh, means that we can diversify our sources of, uh, of, of food, not just for humans, but also for livestock production. Allow me one additional question, Tim, um, uh, to your um, uh, to you. Um, you said yes, um, uh, and very, uh, uh, and this this is very much appreciated. What you said, like that, uh, there is a there is a change going on, and they need to change on midterm and long term perspective. And you also mentioned the the short terms uh, uh, things which needs to be done. I wonder um, whether it could be 
a signal and whether it could be um, a, catal a catalyst to bring the African countries as the African Union stronger mm -hmm. into um, uh, <clears throat> into contact, so to say. You are in contact, I know this, but to, 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 to make the network much stronger than before. Would you agree on that? I would agree on that, Michael. And I think currently, I think maybe I can just mention the specific policy. We have now the Africa Free Trade Continent Area. Uh, one of the biggest objectives of, of, of that is to improve food trade within African countries. And, and the, the idea here is that, you know, as part of um, reducing reliance on, 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 on traditional sources, is that we can trade amongst ourselves. But, but the challenge, of course, has been in the past, we had a number of barriers um, that limited trade within African countries. But we hope that by with this kind of policy now being implemented in the entire African Union, uh, reducing or removal of those of those barriers will allow for more food trade within African countries, and definitely that uh, means that we can we are likely to get it cheaper, uh, but as well as well as also reduce reliance on uh, the traditional grain basket areas such as Ukraine. Great, thank you, Timothy. Um, Christian, picking up on the food crisis, you were in Ukraine when the grain agreement was negotiated. What were some of your findings or some of the things you learned um, from that? Well, I think it was basically two learnings I had. The first one I can maybe tell from a very personal episode. I was going to Odessa, which is the, the key port for exporting grain from Ukraine to many regions in the world. And it was two days before the agreement. By the way, it's, it's two agreements between the United Nations and Russia and between the United Nations and Ukraine, because Ukraine and Russia don't uh, never signed any agreement. Um, it, it was about to be signed and everyone was hoping that this could be at least a more calm period. But on the very day as I arrived in Odessa, they uh, shot rockets to the harbor and it was massive explosions in Odessa city, which was the first ones for a kind of a long time. There was no military strategic reason for attacking Odessa. It was just to clarify, we can attack you and we might do this. So. The main learning was this agreement is very, very fragile and we can't rely on this neither now nor next year or the year after. And I could also see, I, I went to a tiny port, it's called Reni, which is on the Danube River. And I could see how they improved this port and tried to get the grain out of the country which is the main problem they had back then. They had 20 million tons of grain in the silos just stored. It was not even uh, end of harvesting season. It was just old grain from, from the running season. And they could not get it out there without the Black Sea. So the Black Sea is the key point to get it out there. And we have to guarantee security for this way because through the ports, through the river, um it's they made it up to five million tons per month to get it out this way but the 20 million they would easily do via black sea in normal times and you can't do this on rail and you can't do this with lorries uh this will take too long it's very inefficient and it's very expensive which will have an effect to african countries buying grain from ukraine as well Christian, can you let us know how do the people of Ukraine take this war? And uh, uh, we all know that they are suffering. Yes, but like how on a on a personal level, what what uh, uh, what kind of uh, um, experience uh, uh, have you made? It is a it's a very uh, intense mixture of uh, different emotions or impressions i could say on the one hand side you can see they are clearly suffering from the cold from being hungry being scary being uh, pushed away like the, you have many idps that left their home cities like kharkiv like Mikolaev, kherson and um on the other side you can go to kiev and you can see the cafes are open you can go there you can 
uh, have a night in a bar or in a restaurant and they are they refuse to suffer from the war 24 7 they try to live a more or less normal life and especially when we talked about uh, the grain and the food supply um, you can also see how brave many ukrainians are especially uh, when the harvesting season was ongoing in many regions in kiev in may and june i was there and many of the fields there were mined and uh, they were shot by artillery there were unexploded devices on the fields and the farmer said we have to go on the fields we have to harvest as much as we can we don't know yet how we get it out of the country but we have to harvest it and we have to see it at some point and farmers were killed because they drove on mines i was on the fields with demining fields uh, teams and it's insane how many explosives they found there but they still go out and they say we have to do this and we keep the work up and we will cope with it only one one more question um uh, sorry but it's uh, um i think this is a, a um it, it isn't is it's good to have you because we, you have experience from the ground here and uh, uh, how um, how can we, um, or how can you uh, um, uh, estimate the situation on the ground on Ukraine? Is trade, is that is that functioning in a way that we are used to do? Or is it like, uh, are the, the ways, uh, the, the, the trading lines, are they broken? Is uh, like, how, how, uh, how, how, how is it organized at the moment? The whole trading system, so to say. You mean in the country or yeah, in the country, country, like or like at the at the harbor, for example, like do the things getting out of the country, do the products getting out there? They do get the products out there via the ports. It's getting better and better. The more Ukrainian army is making progress in the south, like the liberating uh, Kherson, for example, was what was, was a key event because it made Mikolaev safer. They get clean water supply for the city, which they didn't have for months before this. And the, the, the trading is working well, but you can also see it's it's the, the speed is getting slower and slower. You can see long queues still on the border with, with trains and lorries and on the ships as well. The harbors are now military's uh, critical infrastructure they're completely blocked for uh, for public you can't really go there and leaving the black sea uh, or shipping the black sea from odessa for example it's the it's on high risk because in the very beginning of the war you could uh, russian army uh, mined the sea as well and you have sea mines there and then ukrainians mined it as well to avoid Russian warships to get to the shore on Ukrainian side and then Russians came and apparently cut off the this, these ropes you have to keep the sea mines in line which means they are free floating in the Black Sea now this will be an issue for years and probably decades that it is becoming dangerous. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, we've touched on the food crisis and now we'll be moving into the energy crisis. And Melanie, we'll start with you. Could you please share with us um, your thoughts on some of the main challenges regarding energy? Um, you mean in, in Europe um, or in general? I mean, of course, what we what we see is um, because of um, also the sanctions, but also but also at a certain point uh, the um, the difficult situation. Um, Europe is in an energy crisis, and now the question is who are other trading partners? I think what we've seen in the past weeks and months. Uh, where um, political discussions on, uh, you know, possible gas deliveries from African countries to the EU. Also, I think was what is in the debate is um, a discussion on uh, the production of hydrogen or green hydrogen uh, in African countries. 
uh, that could first of all be used for energy uh, security in African countries, but at the same time, because you can export hydrogen, uh, function as um, you know an uh, export good, um, and then being used in Europe uh, for their energy supply. So I think there are various proposals on the table and discussions, and also uh, support from European partners. Uh, but like I said, what I also see is um, a hesitance of some um, African countries also to enter into these partnerships where they see the opportunities is also the question what is in there for them and also debates within countries about why should we support Europe with energy while some countries are themselves facing energy crisis? And um, I think this is a bit of a, a, this is really the biggest the biggest issue. Um, yeah. Apart from that, I think there is a second aspect that is sometimes missing, and it is the whole question about um, security of minerals, um, because um, what is clear is that um, we need to increase. Um, the renewable energy production and to manufacture them you need minerals so what we see already is that the demand for minerals will increase for um, the energy uh, transition but also for the mobility transition mm -hmm. um, and then also for digitalization and while there are strategies um, in development on um, you know um, like um, more increasing recycling um, uh, and and uh, circular economy uh, strategies, uh, this won't be enough. So in the next years, uh, we'll see an increase for uh, certain minerals and metals. And I think this is a second angle of a potential partnership where, like I said, a lot of it goes via China still, but there is a debate about relocating supply chains and also relocating or, um, you know, Re reshaping supply chains, building smelters and refineries out of China uh, mm. and support that kind of infrastructure. But the political question is now in Europe or in African states or Latin America, um, because uh, and, and I fully get that. I mean, if you only focus on extraction, it's not a very profitable um, aspect anymore. And also it doesn't create a lot of um, jobs. Uh, so it's an employment issue and a question of local uh, content uh, and local value creation. So what are the, so what are the barriers here that Africa can benefit uh, um, from uh, from from this point? I mean, it is, I think, like from my perspective, I think if Europe wants to like secure uh, supply uh, in minerals energy supply chains, they need to support African countries with regard to build up, you know, um, uh, other mm -hmm. stages of the supply chain apart from, from extraction. So maybe supporting uh, the construction of smelters and refineries, supporting mm -hmm. the energy infrastructure, also supporting the infrastructure to... Um, transport infrastructure. So there is a lot, and sorry to say that, but I think China has done that in certain ways, not always, you know, to an extent where everyone would agree that it was good, um, but I think this is where it needs to go. But it, I think it also requires some African countries to also rethink about their industrialization strategies to also, um, you know, have a national strategy, but also think about how this, how a regional economy, and, and Tim mentioned the AFCFTA, but we could also think about like sub-regional um, organizations sort of, such as ECOVAS or SADC, um, how they uh, want to think about mineral supply chains, how they want to share certain stages of the process. Um, a lot of it is there already, but the key question is implementation. And the second key question is really the competition between some European companies who don't necessarily want it to happen out mm -hmm. of Europe. Um, and um, we we see that in the European Union, there is really a division also between political decision makers about where should it be located. And I think maybe both regions can benefit. Um, it's not an either or, but it definitely has to take into account the interests of African economies and African countries. What is your opinion on that uh, from, from the Nairobi perspective, Tim? No, I totally agree with Melanie that um, one, I think African countries need to uh, rethink um, their, their their industrialization process. I think uh, if you look at Africa going being the last one to industrialize, uh, the, 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 the path in which we were on was more or less to try and copy what 
uh, has happened in other continents. Um, but I think right now that will not necessarily work and we need to think of how best we do it. I totally agree with, again with what Melanie says that um, extractives alone, you know, doesn't give you the boost. And I think we have seen so many African countries uh, that are struggling. They are poor yet they have a lot of wealth in terms of minerals. And this is because of the only extracting and it's being uh, value added elsewhere. So how do we ensure that you're not necessarily thinking of it as getting a piece of the pie, but also saying that we want to grow this to be more sustainable. So as we think of uh, moving away from fossils uh, to more renewable energy, which I think in the region, we are, we are still far from tapping, you know, like the potential that we do have. So there is much, much more that, you know, the continent can benefit from in terms of energy. Uh, but of course, we must make sure that we get the strategy right. Uh, we do understand the pushback from uh, some European companies, uh, even China, uh, because, of course, they would want to maintain some of those businesses within their countries. But that's what now calls for like you know, international and bilateral negotiations to see how both of us can benefit. Because, uh, again, as Madame says, it's not an issue of, of, of you know, us replacing you, but it's an issue of how can we create a scenario where both of us are better off. Um, and able to address the needs. Uh, we must uh, do more in terms of investments in the energy infrastructure. I think for a, for a long time, we've not been doing that, mainly again, because most of this has been, uh, it was mainly reliant on uh, external funding, but we can also reroute some of the local domestic funding you know, to kind of build up the energy infrastructure. So around that, I do totally agree that we do have a lot of uh, uh, opportunities, but I think, getting the strategy right for me would be the first important thing we need to do. Thank you, Timothy. Yes, we need to get the strategies right first. Um, Christian, from your perspective, do you have any um, thoughts you'd like to share with us? Well, to be honest, I'm not really an expert in uh, energy, um, but uh, what we now see in Ukraine, for example, is how bad it can be when you not only on food but also on energy only are dependent on one country because they are mainly and Europe also is mainly dependent on Russian gas supply and we here in Germany I mean we have minus degrees now and people are suffering from having 15, 16, 17, 18 degrees in their flats which is still around 10 degrees more than some people have in Ukraine, they are having blackouts. We are discussing about blackout preparation in Germany as well. Um, I think besides concrete uh, decisions to be made or strategies to be made, what we should be aware of right now is that we can see how it feels and what it is like to run out of energy. And I think we haven't been aware of this because having electricity, having heating, uh, or having cooling, depending on the areas, is for many countries, at least in Europe, something that we just took for granted and we didn't think of it. And I think this makes a difference in thinking of strategies and being aware of where to implement improvements. You are totally right, Christian. Although it is quite interesting uh, when we are looking for solutions coming out of this uh, um war coming out of this tragedy like which is going to happen in the ukraine um i wonder um whether there they there, there can be a shift of strategy uh uh possible um a question for, from from my side we have and you just mentioned it and you pointed it out there is a dependency or we have seen a dependency even in germany or in europe um for example to russia yeah, in, in direction uh, towards russia um I see. I'm not. I'm. I'm not an expert here, but I see there are also dependencies from African countries uh, to Russia or to other countries. Like, how can we? And this is a question to all of three, to the, to to all of you. How can we? Or is it? First of all, is it? Is it? Is it make? Does it make sense to overcome these dependencies? Uh, these these dependencies on one trading on one on, on one big trading partner. First question. Second question: How could it be over? How could it be overcome? Maybe I'm, I'm not an expert for this, but I might add something that came up to my mind: is 
Melanie mentioned something important earlier that we see all the dependencies and the relationships, old relationships that we are questioning now and new relationships we try to create, but especially on energy and on resources, I think we can solve the problem. And from Germany, for, ex uh, for example, we could see, oh, we are dependent on gas and resources from Russia. That's a problem. And now we make new deals with countries like Qatar, which are problematic on another way. And we have to not only think, who are we trading with? but also what are we trading and what do we need and how can we maybe change this? Of course, talking about sustainable energy and so on and so on, but or food, it's the same. Um, and I think we have to think new a little bit more fundamentally. Melanie? Um, I mean, I think, you know, the question is, are we in a phase of deglobalization? Um, <laughs> Because um, part of those, I mean, you know, the, the the result of globalization are these dependencies. But we also have to uh, admit, and I think from a from a European perspective, that globalization has created a lot of unequal and uh, unbalanced relationships. So, um, um, and the side effects are not only side effects, but to many countries in the world and also many people in the world, it has created very difficult working conditions, um, exploitation. Um, I mean, we've seen that and also an externalization, at least from a European perspective of, um, you know, environmental pollution, air pollution, and also uh, cheap labor. So I think the question is, is at the moment a good time to rethink that a bit? I would never advocate for no globalization because I think there are many good ways in it. Yeah, a lot of like a lot of beneficial uh, things, and also I mean I like to being able to travel. Um, and I think the question is, should we grant other people the same opportunities? Could you know, like someone from South Africa enter Germany as easily as I can enter South Africa? So I think this is one of the most fundamental things if we talk about equal relationships. The other thing is, what about uh, thing is what about sustainability? So we could now use this as an opportunity to build more resilient and more sustainable supply chains, which benefits everyone, you know, and is not based on benefit for one partner and maybe exploitation for the others. I mean, I'm ex exaggerating a bit because it's sometimes not as you know there are gray shades in it, um, uh, but I think this is hopefully also a time uh, to think about that. At the same time, I also think, and the pandemic has has revealed that there are certain strategic goods, access to vaccines. I mean, food is so crucial. Also, access to water. Um, those things where we should probably also, you know, think about re-regionalization in a way. So that if something like a pandemic happens, which is not even intentional, it is something that just happens and it affects the whole world, where um, all regions are able to cope with it and not being left behind um, because, you know, they have um, secured their strategic goods in their immediate regional environment. Um, so um, maybe one last point, because Tim mentioned it, um, the African free continental trade area, I think it got a real push during the pandemic because at the very beginning, you know, um, they had, there had been many discussions and talks around it, but when <clears throat> COVID hit, it was very clear. Now we could develop it. So I think this is probably the way to go, a globalized world, but with a regional security of supply. You agree, you are nodding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, I'm, uh, I'm agreeing mainly because I think, um, I think in the region we've been, we, we, we've, we, we've, we've come to, a, like during the pandemic to identify that, you know, sometimes your, people will put your needs last. Um, and you could see, for example, with the vaccines, eh? Um, during the pandemic, you know, Africa got them last, and yet we contributed in the development of those vaccines. Um, so, uh, the, the real, the, actually, the point that I totally agree with Melanie is that the idea is not is not that we should do away with globalization, but then we should also think about the regional focus. Uh, even as a thing that yeah, we want to globalize, um, and we want to maintain some of these, um, you know, relationships uh, and, and, and and business partnerships. But the, there is a point in which we have to kind of step 
back and then think more locally. So our our needs being addressed so that we, are, we do not necessarily say that, you know, we want to kind of break the chain or argue that, you know, globalization, we've seen some externalities uh, that, of course, people can exploit them to argue that, you know, we should now reverse that. But it's more also us thinking of, because regional needs will always be different from one region to the other. And even even though today we are talking about, for example, the entire African continent, you realize that the, the needs within East, West, South, North, uh, would be more unique to those countries in those specific areas. So it's an issue of also like stepping back and thinking of as a region, as a, as a small region to three countries, what, what is the biggest priority for you? And then ensuring that that is being met even as you're thinking of, you know, helping others also meet their needs. One question from 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 my side um, here again um, uh, to what Melanie just said: Is it a, is it a crazy idea to think about that um, a, a business and economy can be organized more in the network logic, uh, more in a in a logic from different partners, from alliances, and not from one partner to 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 another partner um is that uh, could that be um a shift here in in, in business and in and, and, and economy policy uh, which is which could be uh, which is going to happen right now or which could be happen right now um, my prediction is that that may take a bit longer to happen um more so because of the way trade is organized so strategically it would make sense to think of it in terms of networks that you know we we are exchanging or we are contributing to things that we have mutual interest and we have mutual benefits. However, as we've seen, like even in the case, even within the region, why, why, why did it take more than 50 years for us to think about bringing down the barriers for food trade? Why was it easier for us to say, okay, we'll buy our food from Asia or Latin America and not, not from a neighboring African country? So there, there, are, some, there are some levels levers within trade that may not move faster as we expect some of them are strategic um and i can like an example I, i usually see like in the case of kenya uh although yes we know that we are 100 dependent on pakistan for our rice but they also buy bulk of our tea so you cannot come and break that up you know it will take years to renegotiate and agree, you know, how do we move away from, you know, because it's a, it's a reliance that works both ways. So the in as much as we rely more on them for rice, they also rely more on us for tea. And we know that tea is also an important commodity for them. Uh, they are tea drinkers, they're not coffee drinkers. Uh, and, and in this case, you realize that, um, yes, we may think of, yes, it may be good for us, even as a country, to diversify our markets, because if something happens to that country, then we are, we are in problems. We cannot sell, and we cannot buy whatever we need. But it may take a bit of more, um, it will take a bit of more negotiations, it will take a bit of more uh, partnership building, which, which is also something that takes quite a while. Um, for us to think or for us to move some of these trade 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 um, trade levels and uh, of course importantly also for the region is that you realize that um even when you lose a strategic partner um sometimes it's not a, it's not that there's a direct uh how do you call it, like a di displacement or you can displace somebody in a specific market so some of it will will take some some bit of time to to get there but definitely yeah we are seeing that uh, some of the some of the practices or some of the patterns and trends pre pandemic may not necessarily we may not go back to some of what was existing there before and there will be some some kind of shift i think the only thing is how far do we shift and and and, and uh, is more of the question on especially when you think about it in terms of trade Great, thank you. I think we're sort of touching into the next question, but uh, what would be a strategic foreign policy from a European and an African perspective regarding all that we have touched on? Melania, I'll direct this to you. Um, I mean, I think uh, first and foremost, um, engaging more with African partners, but in a sense that they are part of important institutions and, you know, are able to bring up their 
like concerns and also their their needs. Um, I mean, I'm not sure, but also be keen to hear what Tim says about it. I mean, just um, I think a few days ago, um, President Biden, U.S. President Biden, also supported uh, a seat for the AU in the G20 or a stronger inclusion. Um, also, this year we saw, I think, Senegal and South Africa being invited to the G7 conversations. So I think, you know, this is a bit more than just like talk shops, but I mean, this is where crucial decisions are being negotiated um, and where African countries should have a seat. Um, I mean, there's been for a couple of years um, demands from the African Union to also, um, you know, have a seat in the UN Security Council. Um, of course, a reform at the moment with the situation with Russia is a bit unlikely, but I mean, I think this is what matters. I'm not talking about Africa, but really, um, um, you know, having a seat at the tables where decisions are being made. Um, and if, and like I said, I think also from a concrete cooperation point of view, I think visa regulations, this has to change. Uh, it is really impossible, even for me as a researcher, if we want to invite academics from some African countries, it takes forever to get a visa. It is sometimes just not possible to cooperate because it's so so difficult. So if seeing eye to eye, what you know is very often used as a term, uh, is being put into practice, then these things have to change. Um, uh, we don't need to talk, we just need to do it. Um, this is where I see it. And this is, I think, more homework for Europe, uh, not so much for, for Africa. I think looking on the World Cup in soccer, when Morocco is going to enter or has entered the half final, I think it should be possible to get other seats in other institutions or in other systems, so to say, Tim, or would you uh, or, or, or wouldn't you agree on that? Yeah, Marco, I would definitely agree on that. And I think uh, like um, what President Biden has done in, uh, you know, Supporting, you know, Africa to be invited in the and AU as, as AU to be invited in the G, G G twenty. I think that's that's really important. We've seen benefits of that in the past. I think, as Melania said, that when uh, you are there in at the table and and you can also negotiate, so that people don't make decisions on your behalf, uh, because you're the one actually who really understands, you know, what you need and how what you're gonna benefit from whatever is coming out of the negotiation. Um, and I think it's 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 really important that you know Africa continues uh, to to push for that. And I think like the point that Melanie just brought to us, then we need more cooperation. We cannot cooperate if you're putting barriers. Like uh, I really identify with like, the example you've given that sometimes you want to cooperate, but you what stops you is because of some of these um, barriers. You cannot travel. You cannot invite somebody to. To, to, to be together and, and talk about common issues. So how do we, and, and I think also the way people have, of course, this is because of uh, maybe Trump era policies, but the way people have looked at migration is that the best way to stop migration is ensure that all regions are actually developing. Then people will not feel like they need to move from one place to the other. So the, the, the being there, being present at the table, um, provides, confers a lot of benefits, especially for African <clears throat> countries, and uh, allows them to be able to, you know, negotiate, because the issue is that we can actually present uh, our, our issues better when we are the ones doing it ourselves, and also um, appreciate whatever whatever is being offered, because then we know what will work and what will not work. Uh, so moving in that direction, we really hope that, of course, over the next, you know, in the medium, in the medium term, we can have more of these initiatives where we have more representation, direct representation by African countries, um, especially on issues that you know we are trying to solve uh, affecting African people. Thank you very much. I think we've all learned so much from this uh, discussion. This is the 20th edition of Africa Talks with the topic, the war in Ukraine, how can Africa and Europe cope with the dramatic consequences? I would like to give a big thank you to our three experts, Melanie, Timothy, and Christian, for their insightful contributions during this talk. 
yeah, let me add also my uh, uh, my gratitude uh, to all of, to the three of you, and I think we all agree, especially in these hard times, uh, uh, just before Christmas, like that we wish uh, our neighbors, like from talking from the European perspective, our neighbors in the, in the Ukraine, the, the people of Ukraine, that we that we wish them peace, 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 and again peace, and uh, that they will have a Christmas like uh, they have deserved. I would say, uh, in a way, uh, what 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 we also have and uh, um, i think that was a, a really good and deep talk a deep to con, uh, con conversation uh, uh, with with you melanie uh, christian and tim thank you very much for that next week we have still another edition on africa talks uh, coming up before christmas uh, because we have another world issue or another world topic uh, which is being discussed at a conference called COP15, the World Nature Conference uh, in, in Montreal at this time. And we want to discuss the results of it. Hopefully they are already finished then. Otherwise, we have the results so far to be discussed. Uh, looking forward to discussing that with experts from conservation and civil society. Thank you here. Goodbye. Take care. Stay healthy and uh, all the best for you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.